Hello and welcome to our recall session on the NEET 2022 exam. Right, so since these are recall based MCQs, there might be some difference in the language of the question and in the options. But the basic purpose is to just go through the important topics that have been asked in our recent exams. So let's start with the distribution of the MCQs. The maximum number of questions were asked from mycology as many as five. In fact, there were six questions and the bacteriology had six questions. Parasitology had one and virology had two. I am not discussing the sixth question in mycology that was chromoblastomycosis because that is so often asked and it will probably be also discussed in our dermatology session. So please remember, yes, this also came as a question, but I'll discuss the rest of the mycology questions. Right, let's get started with mycology questions. A female patient presents with complaints of thick, curdy vaginal disc secretions. Microscopy of the vaginal secretions showed can, uh, sorry, budding yeast and pseudo hyphae. Which medium will be used to identify the likely species? So, curdy, white vaginal discharge, what does it tell you that this lady is suffering from? candidiasis and as expected what are we going to see we are going to see budding yeast and pseudo hyphae which medium will be used to identify the likely species now there are at least 150 species of candida how will we identify basically we are being asked which is the differential medium for identifying the candida species so options sabrods dextrose agar chrome agar brain heart infusion agar and bird seed agar. In this, the answer to this question is option B, chrome agar. Okay. Now, sabrods dextrose agar is a medium commonly used for growing most of the fungi. And on this medium, all candida colonies will be absolutely the same. They will be forming these off-white pasty colonies. So this is definitely not a differential medium. This is the differential medium for candida. It is containing certain chromogenic substrates which will break down, which will be broken down by certain species when they grow on them. And they will, so they will break down certain substrates which will undergo a color change. That's why we call them as chromogenic substrates. So on this medium, many important species of candida it cannot identify all this 150 species of candida but the common human isolates can be identified by the color on this medium for example candida albicans will form light green colored colonies glabrata will form of white colored colonies candida tropicalis with these white colonies with some blue centers and so on okay so that is why that's our answer to this question Niger seed medium is a differential medium for cryptococcal species. We have non-pathogenic cryptococcal species, most of them, and two species of cryptococcus, that is cryptococcus neoformans and cryptococcus gatti, which are the species of, of cryptococcus which produce the lacase enzyme, which is also called as the phenol oxidase enzyme. So this enzyme is detected by this special medium that is Niger seed, also called as bird seed medium, also called as the Stibes medium. Okay, so this contains basically caffic acid. And when these two, either of these two species will grow on this medium, they will produce this enzyme and caffic acid will be broken down into form melanin. And that's why on this medium, both Cryptococcus gatti and Cryptococcus neoformans will form chocolate brown colonies and the other non-pathogenic Cryptococcal species will form of white colonies. Okay. Right. Next question, a patient presents with cervical lymph adenopathy, disseminated maculopapules. He was investigated and found to be HIV reactive. Biopsy of the skin lesions was cultured at 28 and it showed a velvety growth with red diffusible pigment on the underside. Which of the following is the likely dimorphic fungus the patient is infected with? So we have an HIV patient who is having some skin lesions 
And when we did a biopsy, we isolated a fungus, which is, they are asking it should be a dimorphic fungus, which is producing a red diffusible pigment. What is your answer to this question? Of course, it is Telleromyces manifi. Amongst the options mentioned, only these two are dimorphic. And amongst them, this is the one which forms this kind of red diffusible pigment. Okay. Right. So that is Telleromyces marnefi, which was earlier called as Penicillium marnefi. When we grow this fungus at room temperature, that is 25 to 28, the mold form forms. And this is how it looks like. Let Look at the beautiful pigment diffusing around the colonies. And when you prepare a lactophenol cotton blue mound, you are going to see these high lines, septate hyphae, and you are going to see these brush-like conidiophores brush like conidiophores right and the yeast form at 37 degrees celsius that is on the tissue specimens of the infected patients what are you going to see you're going to see these ellipsoidal yeast cells which are not dividing by formation of budding but they are formation dividing by the formation of transverse septic now, remember that Telleromyces marnefi, where is it reported from? It is mainly reported from Southeast Asian countries. Okay, that's where it is reported from, including Northeastern India. So, even from India, Telleromyces marnefi is reported. So, we have our dimorphic fungi. Please remember them that these are the dimorphic fungi. That is yeast at 37 highline septate molds at room temperature. And that's the mnemonic you're going to remember them by spore tailed cocks, blasted para, and histo. So this is sporothrix shenkai. From the word tail, we're going to remember Telleromyces marnefi. From cox, we're going to remember coccidioides, emetis, and posadasi, blastomyces. Paracoxidioides and histoplasma. So spore tailed cox, blasted para, and histo. Those are the dimorphic fungi. A patient presents with an itchy macule on the axilla for the last few days. On taking the skin scrapings, culture showed colonies that had a red, non diffusible pigment on the undersurface. Lactophenol cotton blue stain showed septate branching hyphae with pencil shaped macroconidia and a few microconidia. Which of the following is the etiological agent for these skin, rather the itchy macule in the axilla? So, what's your diagnosis? Thinking of pencil shaped macroconidia, few microconidia, this is definitely a dermatophyte. And what's that dermatophyte? Trichophyton that forms pencil shaped microconidia. So T E M, trichophyton, epidermophyton, and microsporum. They form those shaped of macroconidia. P C B, pencil shaped, clavate or club shaped, and this was boat shaped. Okay. So our option, so this is definitely trichophyton, but amongst the options mentioned, all of them are species of trichophyton, which is the one which is going to form a non-diffusible pigment, which is red in color. The name itself is telling us trichophyton rubrum. Okay, right. So our answer is, so this was, these were two questions, diffusible pigment for Telleromyces and non-diffusible pigment of trichophyton rubrum. So this is the upper surface of the uh, colonies of trichophyton rubrum. This is the undersurface. It is non-diffusible pigment. And those are the pencil-shaped macroconidia of trichophyton species. They also form few microconidia. A patient with poorly controlled diabetes is brought to the emergency with fever, cough, and difficulty in breathing. He is diagnosed to be suffering with severe COVID-19 infection. Due to persistently low oxygen saturation, he started on high-dose steroids. 
he starts to complain of facial pain and loosening of teeth five days later. What is the diagnosis? What's your diagnosis here? We have a severe COVID-19 patient who is having uncontrolled or poorly controlled diabetes and has now been started on high dose steroids. Diabetes plus high dose steroids. These are the two very, very important risk factors for mucormycosis. So what's your diagnosis? Mucormycosis. Okay. No specified risk factors for coccyx, blastomyces, etc. Right? These are not anything specific. Diabetes with steroids is a very, very important risk factor for mucormycosis. All mucorails, what is their morphology? Do you remember? How would you describe them, their morphology? They're all highline. Let's not talk about highline. They will talk about them in relation to septate IV. They form broad ribbon like aseptate or cenocytic molds okay so or hyphae rather so i just wanted to show you these pictures first and this that's a typical case so infection usually and mucormycosis in such patients generally starts from the sinuses so it starts as a sinusitis and gradually because all mucorails are angioinvasive in nature they are angioinvasive they show vascular invasion they will read quickly spread to the surrounding tissues, to the face, to the mouth, to the orbit, and even to the brain. So that's why we generally call it as rhino cerebral mucormycosis or rhino oculo cerebral mucormycosis, right? So that's, it is, these are typical pictures of mucormycosis. The most common cause of mucormycosis is not mucor species. It is rhizopus aerysis. Okay, so those are the broad ribbon-like aseptate hyphae and what kind of branching do they show? Generally right angled branching or up obtuse angle branching. Risk factors for mucormycosis, poorly controlled diabetes, patients on long high dose steroids, elevated levels of free iron, patients who are being receiving treatment with iron chelator in the form of only deferoxamine, not the other iron chelators, neutropenia, hematological malignancies, and patients receiving immunosuppressive therapy for transplantation. Okay. And HIV is not a risk factor for mucormycosis. Even that has been asked. Right. Let's move on to our next question. We are still continuing with questions on fungi. A truck driver presented with cough and breathlessness. X-ray chest showed right lower lobe pneumonia. Further investigation showed severe neutropenia. So we have a patient who has pneumonia along with neutropenia. All bacterial cultures of the sputum were negative. Lung biopsy histopathology showed dichotomous branching septate hyphae. The moment we read the dichotomous word, we always remember aspergillus, acute angled or 45 degree angled or dichotomous branching like this. You know, they are branching like this. That means this is aspergillus. What is the likely agent? Aspergillus is our answer. Okay, so those are the slender septate hyphae with acute angled dichotomous branching. Look at these septations. Look at the acute angled branching. A 12-year-old boy presents with right upper quadrant pain, calf pain, conjunctival suffusion, icterus, and fever. Examination shows tender hepatomegaly, no history of dyspnea, hemorrhage, oliguria, and no travel history. Vitals were normal. What is the most likely diagnosis? Please remember the moment you read the word, a patient is presented with fever and with conjunctival suffusion and calf pain. These are two very characteristic symptoms of leptospirosis. And of course, the word icterus is mentioned. So jaundice with conjunctival suffusion, that is congestion with calf pain. Sometimes even conjunctival hemorrhages may be mentioned. Think of ecterohemorrhagic fever or hepatorenal syndrome or the wheels disease caused by leptospira species. So our answer here is leptospirosis. 
in chicken gunia what how do we rule a chicken you never think of conjunctival suffusion or icterus or you know yes the patient does have joint pains in chicken gunia but those are really crippling joint pains that is nothing there is nothing specific mentioned regarding joint pain so we rule out chicken gunia dengue hemorrhagic fever how it can be hemorrhagic fever and there when there are no hemorrhages and in dengue some other things are mentioned symptoms like nausea vomiting rashes retro orbital pain saddle back fever etc those are mentioned hepatic encephalopathy due to hepatitis a yes hepatitis a can lead to hepatomegaly ictus but it will not be associated with these conjunctival suffusion calf pain also vitals were normal so how can the patient be in hepatic encephalopathy okay so our answer here is leptospirosis how does lept how do we get infected with leptospira species animal urine exposure broken skin or mucous membrane exposure to urine contaminated water most commonly the reservoir is rodents but it could be because of other domestic animals also and 5 to 10% of infected individuals develop the more severe disease wheels disease there are it's a biphasic illness after an incubation period of 5 to 14 days initially the leptospires are present in the blood that's the stage of leptospiremia that's what were the mentioned the symptoms that were mentioned that is conjunctival suffusion fever and those calf pains etc those were mentioned and next is the stage of deposition of immune complex that's the time the patient presents with jaundice with hemorrhagic manifestations with renal involvement in the form of oliguria hematuria or it might be written as raised blood urea nitrogen those are the so this patient is actually not in the leptospiremic state it's not in the immunological state but in the leptospiremic stage so these would be seen in this stage okay with or without meningitis often commonly associated with meningitis right and leptospires which are spirochetes these are very very slender bacteria and they have this typical morphology they are closely wound slender spirals which cannot be seen by the light microscope they can be visualized only under the dark ground microscope either one end is hooked or both the ends are hooked when one end is hooked what do we call it as umbrella handle appearance or shepherd crook appearance a 30 year old military jawan presents with fever myalgias and rashes all over the body sparing the palms and the soles similar complaints were noted in many of his fellow jawans on physical examination lice were noted on his body so this is body louse which is spreading the infection from one jawan to the other and which of the following is responsible for the condition all the species mentioned here are of rickettsia which is the rickettsia which is transmitted by human body louse it is rickettsia provazaki which causes epidemic typhus also called as gaul fever right so that's our answer option b so which are the important louse transmitted infections please remember epidemic typhus which is caused by rickettsia provazaki epidemic relapsing fever caused by borrelia recurrentis and trench fever caused by bartonella quintana remember also a very important point that in louse transmitted infection it is not the bite of the louse it's the feces of the louse which is containing the the infective form so it's the crushing of the louse against the skin that's how we get the infection with these respective bacteria okay and regarding epidemic typhus which is the mnemonic we have learned to remember the important things human epidemics are profound and lousy epidemic typhus is caused by rickettsia provazaki the vector is body louse and humans are the reservoirs except in one part of north america where even flying squirrels are the reservoirs right so epidemic typhus caused by rickettsia provazaki vector is body louse and reservoirs are humans mode of infection 
crushing of the louse against the skin, which inoculates the feces of the louse into the skin, bricks. A person presents with sepsis was admitted to the hospital and administered antibiotics for 10 days. He has now developed watery diarrhea and dehydration. So he was on antibiotics and now has gone into antibiotic associated diarrhea. Which of the following is the best investigation to diagnose Clostridium difficile infection? Rather, Clostridioides difficile infection, right? So we know antibiotic-associated diarrhea, antibiotic-associated colitis, and a severe version of this is called as pseudomembranous colitis, is caused by a normal flora of the GI tract, Clostridioides difficile, administration of broad spectrum antibiotics like third generation cephalosporins, clindamycin, ampicillin, amoxicillin, fluoroquinolones kills the normal flora of the GI tract. And if the patient is having a colonization by clostridioides difficile, they will produce, in case they are toxigenic, they will produce toxin A and B responsible for these diseases. So how do we arrive at the diagnosis? First of all, we prove that the patient is having an infection or is colonized by Clostridium or Clostridioides difficile. What do we do? We will find that out. Plus, yes, it's a normal flora in the GI tract. So just detecting the organism in the stool does not tell us that this is AAC or AAD. We have to prove that the patient is having a toxigenic, it's, the patient is infected with a toxigenic strain so we have to do a toxin detection assay. So answer to this question is option B. Detect the organism by detecting the clostridioides difficile specific glutamate dehydrogenase followed by detection of the toxin in the stool by the following modalities that we're going to study later. Option A is absolutely incorrect because clostridioides or and clostridium are all anaerobic organism, just detection of the en specific enzyme in the stool does not prove the diagnosis. Stool microscopy is not going to show anything specific regarding Clostridium difficile infection. So diagnosis of Clostridium Clostridioides difficile infection can be done by the following modalities. Detection of the organism followed by the detection of the toxins. It is generally a combination of the two that is used to arrive at the final diagnosis. So how do we detect the organism in the stool? By doing anaerobic culture. And what is that medium for it? CCFA. CCFA medium. Okay, this is cyclosinine, cefoxitin, fructose agar. Okay, or we can do an easy to do test. Use an ELISA to detect the enzyme specific to clostridium. Clostridioid is difficile in the stool, that is GDH detection. Then follow it up with the detection of the toxin in the stool. That can be detected either by the tissue culture assay or the cytotoxicity assay. But this is very, very difficult to do. It can only be done in special reference laboratories. Or we can do an easy to do ELISA. Or we can amplify the toxin A or toxin B genes by PCR. Right? So generally, it's a combination of the two which is used to arrive at the final diagnosis. And colonoscopy will be useful whenever there are pseudomembranes found in the uh, overlying the colonic mucosa. This is, of course, 100% specific, but sensitivity is poor of colonoscopy. We have another question on Clostridioides difficile. A woman presents with, uh, with a clinical history of diarrhea is on broad spectrum antibiotic therapy. Which of the following is not true regarding Clostridioides difficile? Rather, infection. Okay. Option A, it is toxin mediated. Yes, it is absolutely correct. Option B, oral fidaxomycin is used for the treatment. Yes, that has now superseded vancomycin as the drug of choice. 
It can be confirmed by using IgM assay. We just talked about the various modalities for diagnosis. <clears throat> Serology has no role in diagnosis of CDI. Pseudomembranes consist of leukocytes, fibrin, and cellular debris. Absolutely correct. So answer is option C, which is incorrect. Now, please remember what we've studied this in our regular class also, that Clostridioides difficile produces toxin A and toxin A or toxin B, or both of them, which are basically, where are they acting? What are they doing? They, we have certain enzymes, GTPases, Rho, RAC, and CDC42. These are GTP breaking down enzymes, which are responsible for maintaining the normal function of the actin cytoskeleton or maintain the actin polymerization. So whenever toxin A and toxin B are produced in the colon, by the germination of Clostridioides difficile, what are they going to do? They are going to glucosylate these active enzymes, these enzymes leading to their inactivation. So they, so they are basically, what are these toxins? They are glucosyl transferases. These toxins are transferring a glucose from the, taking it from UDP glucose and transferring it to these Rho, RAC, and CDC42. This leads to the dysregulation of the actin cytoskeleton leading to apoptosis. Okay. So those are the pseudomembranes which are consisting of basically cellular debris, leukocytes, and so on, fibrin. A teacher recently joined a school in the village and few days later developed rice watery stools. This is definitely patient has got cholera. The causative agent acts on which of the following receptors to produce its action? That's such a simple question. What is the receptor for the cholera toxin? It is the GM1 ganglioside. What's the site of action of cholera toxin? The small intestinal or to the ileal mucosa. Okay. Right. So that's our cholera toxin, an AB5 subunit toxin that is secreted by Vibrio cholerae. Right, it binds to the GM1 receptor and it gets endocytosed. It is transported to the endoplasmic reticulum. Here, the A subunit separates from the B subunit, further undergoes proteolysis into two fractions, A1 plus A2. Now, A1 enters the cytoplasm and it asks NAD, give me an ADP ribose moiety. I'm going to transfer it to the alpha subunit of the G stimulatory protein. Okay, so what is it doing? ADP ribosylation of the G alpha subunit. And this leads to persistent activation of adenyl cyclase, leading to massive increase in cyclic AMP. Okay, and this leads to act continued activation of certain protein kinases, which keep on phosphorylating the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator okay then that leads to the pumping out of ions into the intestinal lumen leading to those typical rice watery stools you can pause this video and just go through all the steps of the action of cholera toxin this can be asked in in fact it has been asked by on by you know at various steps it has been asked even if this has been asked what does it act on it leads to the activation of protein kinases which keep on phosphorylating this cftr i think it's amazing to know all the steps of the various toxins because that really gives you that pump yes i know the steps i can answer any question regarding this toxin so which are the toxins which act by increasing cyclic amp just pick up the first alphabet of these words exotoxins acting by cyclic amp are enterotoxigenic e coli labile toxin the anthrax toxin, Bordetella pertussis. It produces the pertussis toxin and the adenyl cyclase toxin. And finally, the cholera toxin. All these are acting by increasing cyclic AMP.
what is the mechanism of action of botulinum toxin? So we got two toxins action. It stimulates the muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. It stimulates the release of acetylcholine. It inhibits the release of acetylcholine and it stimulates the muscarinic receptors. I am not sure about the wordings of the options here. It might be different from the actual original ones. Okay. Answer to this is very, very simple. What does the botulinum toxin, how does it cause that flaccid paralysis preventing the release of acetylcholine? How does it do so? You know, for the release of acetylcholine, there are certain proteins which are working together and those proteins together form the snare complex. And this snare complex leads to the fusion of the acetylcholine vesicles with the neuronal membrane. So botulinum toxin, what is it doing? Presynaptic inhibition of acetylcholine release. Where is it acting? What is it doing? It is proteolizing the snare complex proteins. So B, D, F and G. Of course, there are some types of botulinum toxins, antigenic types. B, D, F and G. What are they acting upon? The vesicle associated membrane protein proteolysis. What about botulinum toxin C? It is breaking down syntaxin and A, C and E are breaking down SNAP25. So botulinum toxin C is acting both on syntaxin also as well as SNAP25, that is synaptosome associated protein. And hence the fusion does not occur of the acetylcholine vesicles and inhibits the release of acetylcholine. Okay, that's how it leads to flaccid paralysis, all that uh, diplopia, blurring of vision, dysphagia, dysarthria, dry mouth, dilated pupils, descending symmetric flaccid paralysis is because of preventing the release of acetylcholine, right? And what's the site of action? Do you remember the four sites I had asked you to remember? neuromuscular junctions, autonomic ganglia, parasympathetic postganglionic terminals, and sympathetic postganglionic terminals, which release acetylcholine. A previously well 35-year-old man presented with high-grade fever, severe body aches, headaches, rigors, chills of four days duration. Dengue, malaria, blood cultures were negative. A chance peripheral blood smear examination showed sheathed larvae with two nuclei in the tail tip. What is the etiological agent? So blood is positive. So peripheral blood smear examination is showing us some sheathed larvae. Which are these larvae? They are called as microfilaria with two nuclei in the tail tip. What is the etiological agent? This area agent is Brugia Malay. So basically, this patient is suffering with acute filarial fevers, which are seen in the initial stages of filariasis. Okay, right? And uh, that answer is Brugia Malay, right? Let me show you these the life cycle. We know that mosquito is the vector, and humans are the definitive hosts in case of uh, filarial. Uh, lymphatic filarial causing worms, right? Filariasis is causing worms. So we have the mosquito taking a blood meal and what is it inoculating? It is inoculating the L3 larva. It is not inoculating the microfilaria. These are going to mature into the adult worms and they are going to be found in the lymphatics. These, the females will produce microfilaria, which will be seen in the peripheral blood, right? And they will enter, so they will enter the peripheral circulation. And during a blood meal, these microfilaria will be taken up by the mosquito and it will mature finally in the mosquito's mid gut as the L3 larva. So please remember that microfilaria is not the infective form for humans, it is the infective form for the mosquitoes. It is L1 larva, larva stage one. And in all nematodes, including lymphatic worms, the, uh, the infective form is L3 larva. Okay, right. So these are the microfilaria that were seen in the peripheral blood. So this is Brugia malay. Yes, it is reported also from India. So in India, we have both Wuchereria and Brugia causing filariasis. So here we have these worms 
which are sheathed. They have this sheath. This is the anterior end. So head space, the cephalic space is rectangular. It is, you know, lots of secondary annular kinks are there. The body nuclei are very closely placed to each other. So it's giving a blurred nuclear column. And we have two nuclei in the tail tip. Okay. When we compare it with Vucheria bancrofti microfilaria, they are slightly longer in size. There is a square shaped head space, right? The nuclear nuclei are not so closely crowded with each other. You can see the distinct nuclear column. There are no secondary angular kinks and there are no nuclei in the tail tip. Okay. And there is a third uh, option that was mentioned loa loa. Even that produces um, sheath micro. Please remember the five. Uh, Filarial worms, Wucheria, Brugia, Loa Loa, Oncosarca, and Mansonella. Out of these, Wucheria, Brugia, and Loa, they produced sheathed microfilaria. So we need to rule out Loa Loa also. How do we rule it out? It has lots of nuclei in, a, in the tail tip. Okay. So the whole lots of nuclei in the tail tip will be seen. And Loa Loa is generally reported from a person who has visited Africa. Right. A photographer he recently returned from Egypt presents with abdominal pain, hepatomegaly, hemorrhagic manifestations, and renal dysfunction. Right. So liver involvement, hemorrhages, and kidney involvement. He was given treatment. However, he deteriorated. On autopsy, hepatocytes showed intranuclear Taurus bodies. So this is our biggest hint. One, there is history of travel to Africa and two, Taurus bodies. So what's your diagnosis? This is yellow fever the patient is suffering from, right? Which vaccine could have prevented this? What is the vaccine against yellow fever? It is the 17D vaccine. Right. So those are some names of inclusion bodies related to the disease or rather the infection. Taurus bodies are the inclusion bodies of yellow fever. Negri bodies of rabies. Where are they most commonly seen? In the hippocampus. Guarneri bodies are the inclusion bodies of the smallpox virus, cowdery A of herpes, cowdery B of adenoviruses. Leventhal coal lily bodies or LCL bodies are the inclusion bodies of chlamydia cytacea. Henderson-Patterson bodies are of molluscum contagiosum virus and halbers teeter provasec bodies are the inclusion bodies of chlamydia trachomatis, A, B, B, A, and C, the ones which are causing trachoma. Okay, right. And those are some important vaccines or the strains um, incorporated in the vaccine. So yellow fever, the 17D vaccine, it contains the original ACB strain. Measles, Edmonston, Zagreb strain, mumps virus, is the, the vaccine is called as the Gerald Lynn strain, rubella vaccine is called as RA27 oblique 3, Japanese encephalitis, it contains the following strains. Okay, I'll just mention that this could be the name of the vaccine or it could be the name of the strain. Japanese encephalitis, SA14142, Beijing 1 strain, Nakayama strain, Kolar strain. Polio vaccine strains are called as Lansing, Leon, Brunhild. Of course, the names of the vaccine are Sabin and <clears throat> Sark vaccines. Sabin, the live attenuated one, and the Sark is the killed vaccine. Varicella, it's the Oka strain. The name of the vaccine is called as Varivax. Tuberculosis, it's the BCG vaccine, contains the Danish 1331 strain. Diphtheria, it's the Park William 8 strain, and cholera vaccine. This contains the strain CVD103HGR. Refresher on yellow fever that belongs to the family Flaviviridae. Flaviviruses are enveloped viruses which have a positive single sense RNA and they have an icosa icosahedral symmetry. Yellow fever is mainly reported from Africa and South America, never reported from Asia indigenously. The vector is Aedes. Now, there are two cycles of the yellow fever. 
that is the jungle cycle or the sylvan cycle, also called as sylvan cycle and the urban cycle. So remember, in the jungle cycle, primates act as the reservoirs, but in the urban cycle, it is just human to mosquito transmission. The virus itself infects the hepatocytes, causing mid-zonal hepatic necrosis. And on microscopy, we are going to see torus bodies. The necrosed, hyaluronized hepatocytes, when they are stained, they appear as eosinophilic masses. These are called as council men bodies. It also affects the kidneys. We are going to see fatty degeneration of the tubular epithelium. Mortality rates of yellow fever is 20%. And diagnosis is mainly done by detecting the presence of IgM antibodies in the patient's serum. And of course, we have the 17D vaccine, which is a live attenuated vaccine. A single dose of this vaccine gives lifelong immunity lifelong immunity. Earlier it was 25 to 30 years, now it has been extended to lifelong. A 26-year-old woman presents with anogenital warts. Following gene studies, it was found that she's have at a high risk of cervical cancer. Which of the following HPV types is likely responsible for the warts? So basically we are being asked that amongst these options, which of the following is having a high risk of cancer. That is, answer to this is HPV-18. Okay. Now, there are more than 200 genotypes of human papilloma viruses, and depending upon their propensity to, to infect the stratified epithelium of the skin or the mucous membranes, they are categorized into cutaneous types and mucosal types. Further, they are divided into low-risk and high risk depending upon their propensity to cause cancers. So those in which those which are associated with high risk incidence of carcinomas, here basically the genome of the virus gets integrated with the host cell genome. Right? Similarly, so in mucosal type. So cutaneous types which cause skin warts and epidermodysplasia verruciformis. Right. So these are basically. Uh, Low-risk ones are causing skin warts and high-risk ones are causing epidermodysplasia verruciformis. Also called as the tree man syndrome. Anyone remembers which are the low-risk cutaneous types causing skin warts? One, two, five, seven. And epidermodysplasia verruciformis is caused mainly by the high-risk types, which are these five and eight. Coming to the mucosal types, low risk, they mainly cause genital warts, they cause respiratory papillomatosis, which are these 6 and 11. High risk types are mainly associated with both anogenital carcinomas and oropharyngeal carcinomas. Okay. Right, which ones are these? 16, 18, most often 16 and 18. Others include 31, 33, 35, 45, 52, 54, 58, and many more. Okay, but this does not mean if they are associated with cancers, they cannot cause uh, genital warts. Of course, 90% of genital warts are mainly caused by 6 and 11, but this patient was likely infected with 18. Okay, and that's why she was at high risk of developing anogenital carcinoma. Okay, a quick review of the genome of papilloma viruses. It's a double stranded DNA genome, and it is divided into three regions a regulatory region, an early region which encodes non structural proteins, which six non structural proteins E1, E2, E4, and E5. And E6 and E7, these are the oncoproteins, oncoproteins, E6 and E7, right? What does, how do they act as oncoproteins? They inactivate the products of the P53 and the retinoblastoma gene, okay? So this inactivates the product of the P53 gene and this inactivates the product of the retinoblastoma blastoma gene. The late region, this encodes the structural proteins, the capsid proteins, okay? These are L1 and L2. 
L1 is the major capsid protein. And this is what is incorporated, a recombinantly synthesized, recombinantly synthesized L1 protein is what is incorporated in the vaccines with, against papillomaviruses. Okay, Cervarix, Gardasil, etc. What are they containing? They are not containing the oncoproteins. We are, they are containing the major L1 capsid protein, which is going to induce type-specific immunity. So that was our discussion of the NEAT MCQs.